tour is coming in October, uh, October 5th and 6th, um, an outreach, a rescue mission. Um, and they are August. They do have dates now for the Christian Life and Witness course. It's a two-day course. Um, but if you want to partake, uh, help serve in that uh, festival, uh, they do ask that you do uh, partake in that Christian Life and Witness course um, to be able to serve out there at the festival. You can still go to the festival, uh, but they do. They are asking for prayer leaders, um, le uh, people to lead others uh, to Jesus um, after Will Graham does an altar call. Um, but yeah, you can still just attend and, and have a great time too. So that'll be in October up in Loveland. And if you need more information, feel free to check out their website, um, which is listed up on the screen there. So, And with that, open your Bibles to Judges chapter 14. In case you were wondering, yes, we're going to finish the chapter. <coughs> All right, Judges chapter 14, let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you so much for providing your word to us that we can draw from it, that we can glean from it, and we could model our lives after it. Lord, may we take advantage of your word. May we use it and be in it daily. And may we abide with you daily. And may you abide with us here tonight. Just thank you for, for all that you do and all that you've done. And may you open our ears tonight and open our hearts to receive what you have for each and every one of us. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Judges chapter 14, look at verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all your people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore that lion to pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. And then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. So we've been reading about Samson here the last couple of weeks, and we've been taking our time. We've been going kind of slow because it's quite meaty. There's a lot to look at in just these few verses. So it's meany, and there's a lot for us to glean from and draw from from this last judge here in the scriptures. And as we've said before, Samson was set apart to the Lord. He was a Nazarite, having to avoid certain foods, certain activities, even not to cut his hair. Right? And these outward actions would, be, would represent his inward commitment to God. And again, as we've seen and will continue to see, this judge was consecrated, was consecrated to the Lord, but he was not committed to to the Lord. He was not committed to him. Samson was doing his own thing, seeking after what he wanted, what was right in his own eyes. Much like what we've seen with the nation of Israel in this book. But he was living for himself and not living for the Lord, which is not what God desired from him, which is not what the Lord desires from you either. And the Lord doesn't desire that for any of us. John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus told his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, then you will obey me. If you love me, you will follow me. You will listen to me. If we love the Lord Jesus, then we will follow him and his will for us, not our own. And no, it won't be absolutely perfect, but our lives will head in his direction. He will have that desire. We will have that desire to live for him and not for ourselves. We will have that desire to live for him and less for ourselves, right? Who we were before Christ, who we were before we gave our lives to Jesus. 
and very much less of this world. If we love Jesus, then we will live for him and not for ourselves. If you love Jesus, you will desire to live for him and not for yourself. But unfortunately, sadly, many who say they follow Jesus continue to live for themselves. They will do what is right in their own eyes, which is what we continue to find from Samson again and again and again. This turning aside from the Lord and turning to sin. Look at verse 8. It says, After some, time, some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. Verse 9, he scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. When we first started reading Samson's account, we read that he went down to Timnah. Samson went down, down into compromise, down into sin, hanging out in a place he had no right to be, looking at things he had no right to be looking at. And he saw this Philistine woman, and immediately he wants to marry her. And he comes back to tell his parents, but his parents resist. But Samson insists, and his parents eventually give in. So they all three travel down to Timnah, and on their way to this place, if you remember, a roaring lion shows up to attack, and Samson is able to conquer this lion. He's able to tear it apart, tear it to pieces because of the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And now, after some time, a few months, some say possibly a year later, Samson returns again for the wedding, the, ceremony, the, the celebration. And as he heads towards Timnah, the Bible says he turned aside. He turned aside. He turned aside to see that dead lion. He goes to see the lion, finds a swarm of bees and some honey, and then he scoops out the honey from the carcass. Remember, this judge was not supposed to touch anything that was dead, and for him to grab the honey, for him to scoop it out, he would have to touch the dead carcass. He would have to violate his vow to the Lord, violating his dedication to the Lord. Samson turned aside and fell, fell right into sin. He went off the path. Flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 5, to the left just a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, look at verse 32. It says, You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. The New Living Translation says this in verse 33. It says, Stay on the path the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Stay on the path. There was a path Samson was to follow. It was the Nazarite vow reflecting his dedication to God, but he got off the path. He turned aside, reflecting his dedication to himself, reflecting his dedication to sin and living for sin. And for you and I, church, there is a path we are to follow as well. That path is Jesus Christ. That path is Jesus Christ. That path is right here in our hands in God's word. That is what we are to follow. Samson turned aside from his path and he turned where? Right into sin. When you step off that path of God's word, when we veer off course, when we go a different direction, when we turn aside from his word, we end up in the very same place. You will end up in the very same place, that place of compromise, that place of sin. And take notice here, this is a place he wasn't forced to go. Samson wasn't forced to go here. This was a place he wanted to go. Nobody forced him to go there. Nobody held a gun to his head and said, you better go over there or else 
You better go check on that lion or else, right? No one tricked him into going there. This originated from himself. This was of his own desire. This came from his heart, despite knowing what the Lord had instructed him to do, to avoid. This is what Samson wanted to do, but this is not what God wanted him to do. And Samson knew it. Samson knew it very well. How do we know that? Because when he scooped out the honey from the dead lion, he brought some of it to his parents. He brought the honey to his parents. And the Bible says that Samson did not tell his parents. Why would he not do that? <laughs> because Samson knew. Samson knew he broke his vow to the Lord. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he did not want his parents to know. And now he's hiding it. He's hiding what he did. He's hiding his sin. And here's the kind of the worst part or the sad part. Samson doesn't even care. Samson doesn't even care. Right? There's no remorse. There's no guilt for what he did. We don't read that there was any repentance for his actions, for his violation, for his sin. Why? Because he's not committed to the Lord. He is not committed to God. He doesn't care that he disobeyed the Lord. He doesn't care that he sinned against God. A very dangerous place to be in. It's a very dangerous place. But he wanted to see that lion, and he wanted some of that honey, but he did not want to obey the Lord. He did not want to follow the Lord, and where did he end up? Right in sin. He ended up right in sin without any remorse for what he had done. And that is one of the big difference, differences between a heart committed to Christ and a heart that is not repentance for our sin. Because we will make mistakes. We will fall at times. We will turn aside at times. But we have the remorse. We have the conviction in our heart that we messed up. God, I messed up. I'm so sorry. We have that conviction in our heart that we sinned against God. And we want to get right with him again, not hide our sin. And so we repent. We repent because our desire is to live for the Lord and not for ourselves. But yes, yeah, sometimes we do step off that path. Even the great apostle Paul struggled to do what was right. Paul struggled to do what was right too. He would write in the book of Romans chapter 7, he says, I don't really understand my own actions. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I do what I hate. Even saying, I love God's law with all my heart, but I still struggle with sin while in this body, in this flesh. I will still struggle with sin. As long as we remain in this flesh, this body, we will mess up. But it's our heart that belongs to God. It's the heart that God wants. It's your heart that God wants. Is that what your heart wants? Is He your desire? Or is it somebody else? And so when we veer off that path, <clears throat> when we veer off that path, our desire should be to get back on it as soon as possible. Get back on it as soon as possible. Get back to following the Lord and his will for you, his will for us, not my own, but the Lord's. And again, sadly, <laughs> a lot of sadly, Samson continues to follow his own will. He continues to turn aside. His life is like a broken record from one compromise to another, from one sin to another and another and another. He's not changing course. Look at verse 10 back in Judges. It says, His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so, <clears throat> me, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what, this, what it is within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle, 
Put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. Samson throws a party. Samson throws a party. It's more like a bachelor party, if you will. It's a feast, but it was literally a drinking feast. It was full of alcohol and wine, strong drink. Again, Samson was not, having, not supposed to have anything to do with grapes or wine or strong drinks. And he's even surrounded by 30 men, Philistine men, mind you, ungodly men, worldly men, men who have no regard for the Lord. But here Samson goes again. Here he goes again, compromising his faith, violating his vow, his commitment to the Lord, hanging out with people who are not going to lift him up, not going to edify him and his faith in the Lord, his relationship with the Lord. His life is that broken record, one misstep after another. And so he makes a wager, a bet with these 30 companions, and, and if they can answer his riddle within seven days of the feast, then they would receive a prize. 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. This was literally a fine suit of clothes one would wear to an, a special occasion, like a tuxedo, if you will. Expensive. But if these men could not answer his riddle within seven days, they would owe him. They would owe Samson 30 fine linens and 30 changes of clothes. And these 30 men accept. But this really isn't a riddle. This really isn't a riddle. Riddles have common answers figured out by clever thinking. Answers that would be known to most anybody, most people. What Samson shares with these men, though, would only be known to Samson. Samson shares this that would only be known to him. And so what Samson has in mind here is an unfair trick. It's an unfair trick. It's a reflection of his arrogance. It's a reflection of his pride. And it isn't surprising that we see this judge behaving all high and mighty, all puffed up, tricking people. It isn't surprising that he's being unfair to others. He doesn't care how he's treating others, right? Because as we have said many times, the only one Samson cares about is Samson. The only one he cares about is himself, not others. He has no remorse, no second thought, no hesitation, no account accountability in how he's unfairly treating these other men. And keep in mind, when you only care about ourselves, when we only care about ourselves, when it's all about me or it's all about you, we will not care for others. We will not care for others, and we will not even care for the Lord. We will not love others, and in turn, we will not even love the Lord. Flip over to Matthew chapter 22. To the right a little ways. Matthew 22, look at verse 34. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, You shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest, the great and first commandment. Verse 39, And a second is like it. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This is truly only one commandment. This is really only one commandment. If I love God, then I will love others. If I love others, then I will love God. And in turn, if I don't love others, then that means I don't love God. And if I don't love God, then how can I love others? The Apostle Paul would write to the church in Galatia. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
We should expect those in the world to be unable to do this, to love others instead of self. They don't know God and they don't know his love. They have not received it yet. But what's hard and what's difficult and what is painful is when, we, when those who are supposed to be committed to the Lord, those who say they love the Lord, behave this way as Samson here. And they behave just like Samson. Oh, I love the Lord. He's my God. He's my Lord and Savior. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I do women's or men's studies. But then they are very unloving. They are very unloving to their neighbors, don't care about their neighbors or how they treat their neighbors, no accountability in their actions, no remorse because all they care about is themselves, not others, not even the Lord. Right? The agape love of Christ should be flowing through his church, through his people. It should not be our flesh flowing through us. It should not be our pride or our arrogance, not even our, not ourselves, but the love of God should be flowing through his church. But it cannot happen when we remain uncommitted to the Lord. When we don't abide in him and his love instead of ourselves. It will be a life that is destined for misery. Flip over back to Judges again. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> And it says, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house, house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. <laughs> you have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. And then she told the riddle to her people. Hmm. Up to this point, Samson's life seems pretty harmless. Seems like it's all fun and games, being able to do what he wants, chasing after what is right in his own eyes and getting away with it. And having parties, playing games, playing tricks. His life seems to be just that. A life full of fun and games. And yes, it can seem that way for us too. It can seem that way for you. A life full of fun and games. Living for yourself. Living for the things of this world. Living in the flesh without any worry. A life without the Lord. But what you have to understand, what we have to understand, is that there will eventually be a fallout. There's going to be a, a fallout from our choices to live for self and not for God. A life that is filled with hurt and with pain and a life of misery. Even for someone who's supposed to be a follower of the Lord, dedicated to God. Keep in mind what happens to this guy. Keep in mind what happens to Samson. This guy who is set apart for God. Because everything that's going to happen is because of his own actions. Everything that's going to happen is a result of his choices, not the Lord's. And so Samson's rule, his trick, backfires on him. It backfires on him. Frustrated, those men he made the bet with went after who? Wife. They went after his wife, threatening to kill her and her family if she did not find out the answer to the riddle. And this is where his compromise with being unequally yoked with a non-believer will backfire on him. This is where that choice will backfire. Instead of standing with him, instead of standing with her husband, Samson, she stands with her people. She stands with the Philistines. She sides with her own people and not with her husband. And it is a foundational weakness in their marriage where two are supposed to become one, but here we see two remain two, not joined together. And so, so she seeks what she wants. She manipulates her own husband for her own selfish gain. And she ends up being a burden to him, nagging him, pressing him, and the cost will be her husband's heart. The cost will be his trust in her, and the cost will be their marriage. There is division instead of unity, two wills instead of one, two wills competing against each other instead of competing for each other. 
And you could say, well, her life was on the line. Her life and her family were being threatened, right? They could be killed. I get that. I get that. She had to do it. You can say that, but her best option would have been to stay with Samson. Her best option, her safest place would have been to stay with Samson. He was more than capable to handle these men and their threats. He was more than capable. Her safest place against these threats was with her husband, and the best way for any marriage between a man and a woman to stand against the threats that come against them, the attacks from this world, from others, from the enemy, is to know God's will for marriage and abide in it. Abide in it and not outside of it. And the second, one of them, the husband or the wife, steps out of God's will for marriage, there becomes a weakness in the marriage. There becomes a weakness in that relationship, a, re a weakness the enemy will use to come in and attack, a weakness the world will use to filter in all its garbage about marriage, poisoning the marriage, and it will end up destroying the marriage. This could be its own teaching if we had time. <laughs> But it's so important for, for couples and husbands and wives to know God's will for marriage and for couples to remain in his will for marriage. There's no safer place to be. There's no safer place to be. And so what's the end result of all of this? What is the end result? What do we see? Look at verse 18. Told you we'd get there. It says, and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. He had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife, verse 20, Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Samson realized what has take, realizes what has taken place. If you had not plowed with my heifer, he says, you would not have found out my riddle. It was a derogatory comment about his wife and what she had done to him. He was betrayed. He felt betrayed. She got what she wanted, but she lost her husband's heart. Samson loses the bet, and he becomes angry and bitter about it. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him again, and he goes down to Ashkelon, another Philistine city of whom uh, was Israel's enemy. And Samson struck down 30 men of that city. He took their spoil and gave the garments to those men who answered his riddle. And the Bible says Samson went home to his parents' house in hot anger. He was fuming. He was enraged for what took place between his wife and her people. And who wouldn't be? And even Samson's wife ran off with the best man. It's like a soap opera with these guys. Okay? But his wife ran off with the best man. And the end result for Samson and all of his sin, his compromise, his turning aside, his, his going down is what? Anger, bitterness, hurt, pain, and even betrayal. His life's not so much more, it's not so much fun and games anymore. Life was good for a while for this guy, but it didn't stay that way. He reaped what he sowed. He reaped what he sowed. God's word is very clear about that. That we sow, what we sow, we shall reap. When we sow to our flesh, flesh, we will reap corruption. We will reap anger and bitterness. We will reap pain and hurt and betrayal, not just for us. Not just our, in our own lives, but even in the lives of others too. Those around us. This will be our harvest. This will be our harvest when we live uncommitted to the Lord, when we live for ourselves, when we do what is right in our own eyes and not the Lord's. And we need to take heed. And lastly, as we get ready for communion, I want you to take notice of the Lord here. 
Take notice of the Lord here. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson, not because this guy was betrayed or taken advantage of, not because his feelings got hurt. God was seeking an occasion, as we saw from verse 4 of this chapter. The Lord was looking for an opportunity to come against the people, uh, the Philistines, Israel's enemy. And with it, we see God's sovereignty. We see God's sovereignty, his control and power of all things and all situations to accomplish his will, even the bad situations, even the hurtful situations. He can use all things to accomplish his will. God didn't force Samson to follow him. Samson had a choice, and unfortunately, this judge made a lot of bad choices. But God would use those choices to bring about his plan to save Israel. And we also see the Lord's faithfulness. We see the Lord's faithfulness. That even though Samson was unfaithful, uncommitted to God, God was still faithful. Still working for the good of the people to come and begin to save Israel from the enemies through this one man. And finally, we also see God's grace. We see God's grace, that he would use this judge, this one guy, Samson, to rescue a fallen and broken people. People who want nothing to do with God, who have turned away from him and were wanting to do what is right in their own eyes. It's fascinating when you stop and think about the Lord's heart for us, for them, for you. It's fascinating. It's amazing. It's amazing when you think about his heart towards you. It's the same heart he still has for us today. It's the same heart he still has for you today. And we see it, we find it at the cross. We see his sovereignty, we see his faithfulness, and we see his grace. It's all at the cross where Jesus was nailed and where Jesus would die. Sovereignty because God would use the wickedness and the evil of men and the brutality of the Roman cross to accomplish, accomplish his will. His plan to save you from your enemies of sin and death. Faithfulness because while we were still sinners, while we were living lives of sin and compromise, Christ still came and Christ still died for us. Christ still died for you and for me. While we, we remained faithless, while we remained faithless, God remained faithful. And we see his grace through this one man, the son of man, Jesus, right, who is the son of God, the last true judge who hung on that cross to rescue fallen and broken people. It was God's grace to use this one man, his only son for us, Jesus Christ, to bring about our rescue. Jesus Christ, to bring about our rescue, who we get to celebrate and remember tonight. Christ, our King and our Savior, we get to remember him and celebrate him tonight with communion. And we'll do that now. We're going to pass around the elements. Feel free to take one. And hold on to it. We'll take it together. We'll partake together. So when you get your cup, there's two little cups. One has the bread and obviously the other one has the juice. So hold on to those and we'll take, those to take these together.
Right. Right. So unlike Samson, Christ was perfect. He was our perfect, he is our perfect judge, without sin, without compromise, fully committed to God the Father, surrendered to the Father's will, and his plan to save people, to save mankind, those in need of a rescue, people who are lost, people who are broken, people who are hurting, people who have hurt others and people who have been hurt by others. People who have been disobedient to God, fallen into sin, and need a way out. It's only through Jesus. There is no other way, and we get to remember, we get to celebrate his life and his death for us tonight. So let's do that now. And again, only a sovereign God could use the brutality of a cross, of a Roman cross, to accomplish, accomplish his will. Only a faithful God would send us his son while we were dead in our sins. Only a gracious God would send his son to take our place on that cross. Where he, where Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so we could be forgiven. So we could be forgiven for our sin, for our disobedience, and receive not death, but life. Jesus is who we remember and who we celebrate tonight. So on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, broke it, passed it around and said, this is my body which has been broken for you. This was God's plan. His son would be beaten and broken. His body would be broken, but it was to save, to rescue those who needed him to rescue his people. And so, Father, we thank you for your son, and we thank you that his body was given, and that his body was broken. And in that brutality, Lord, we find forgiveness. We find your grace. We find your faithfulness and sovereignty. So, Lord, as we partake of the bread tonight, of the, of the little cracker here in the cup, Help us remember all that was, all, help us remember the cost of all that took place so we could be forgiven and we could receive life. Go ahead and partake of the, of the bread. And again, on the night he was betrayed, after he took the bread, he took the cup and he passed it around and he said, this is my blood, which has been shed for you. And in the, again, in the brutality of what he endured, his passion and the evil and the wickedness of men, God was still in control. God's plan would still be accomplished and the forgiveness of sin would take place. With the shedding of blood, there is no re without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus' blood shed is what saves us washes, us, washes us white as snow. And we remember that tonight as we partake. Father, we, again, we thank you for your son, that it was his blood that was poured out at Calvary's Hill that would wash us clean. It was his life, his body, his blood that was shed for us. And again, in the, in the brutality of what took place, your plan was still in place. Your will was accomplished, that you would save us. You would res rescue us through the offering of your own son. And so may we remember that tonight, not just through the bread, but also through the juice. And it was his blood that was shed for me. It was his blood that was shed for his people. Go ahead and partake. And Father, again, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you that we could set some time aside on our schedule that we can come and worship you and we can glean from your word and abide with you. As we go forth this week, may you continue to abide with us and may we continue to abide with you.
for all that you are and all that you've done. We thank you so much. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us worship. <laughs>